Welcome into the Husker 24-7 podcast. I'm Mike Schaefer. I'm back from vacation, and I'm joined by Brian Christofferson, who never takes vacation. Brian, how's it going? Oh, I'm going to take vacation pretty soon. Now, after spring ball, of course, which uh, we're about to hit hard, but I'm doing I'm doing well. It's the start of March Madness. We got spring ball in four or five days. What's to complain about? Okay, so you love watching old college football games on YouTube. Yeah, I do. I have to assume that a young Brian Christopherson was super into March Madness. Oh, no question. I still am, but not, I mean. It fades a little bit. I'm now 35. It doesn't mean the same to me as when I was 14. Oh, yeah. Uh, or even 24. Um, so I let me ask you this. What is your favorite buzzer beater from March Madness? Do you have one? Is there one that stands out above all the others? Um, the, yes, it's, uh, it's Duke against Kentucky. Uh, that, oh, the Leitner? Yeah, I'm not, I wasn't a Duke fan at all. I couldn't stand him back then. I've actually grown to respect Duke more. I know I'm not supposed to say that like publicly. Um, uh, we'll edit that out. Yeah, worry. you can get into that. But, um, back then I couldn't stand them. And, uh, I was really hurt when they beat UNLV the one year great UNLV team Duke took them down in the final four uh but yeah the game against Kentucky I I view as like the greatest college basketball game ever played I remember my family were eating pizza watching it and we were all for Kentucky uh Kentucky at that point was sort of coming back off uh sanctions and stuff like that and was kind of getting off the mat so they actually felt like a underdog like a little little yeah. fella little underdog with Jamal Mashburn you know like that sort of underdog um so that one hurt when uh, Leitner hit that shot. It was devastating. And yet even my uh, 10, 11 year old brain was like, that was an amazing game. Like he, the shot Kentucky hit before Leitner sh made that was one of the greatest, would have been one of the greatest shots in college basketball history. It was like a runner in the lane over like two giants uh, that banked in, I believe by Sean Woods that put Kentucky ahead. So that's my favorite game. But I don't know. I could list off like five. I used to love the CBS intro. Uh, it was the old, I think it was Billy Packer. who was like, they won it on the dunk when it was the NC state, you know, over Houston. Yep. I just love that clip. So great tournament. So many yeah. human emotions spill out of it. The, you see the tears and all that. And I, I love a shot of a band member with a tear down their cheek, you know, staining their, um, the Northwestern AD's kid just losing his mind in that Gonzaga game. Yeah, Do you anything remember like... that? <laughs> that kid's in college now. Yeah, that it always comes to my mind too. The Adam Morrison um, on the ground he, crying. Yeah, yeah, I mean that was like one of those moments. Was like, oh man, we're watching something here. Yeah, when they blew it against UCLA, I believe. Yep. No, I um. I gravitate towards, see, you used an example of like what's an all time great game. I feel like the ones that I always think about, though, Brian, are on the first two days of the tournament. Mm -hmm. It's stuff like, uh, I will never forget, like coming home from elementary school, walking with my brother. We turn the games on as soon as we get home. And within a couple minutes, we catch Bryce Drew and Valparaiso. And I want to say within the same year, it was also Mike Miller against Butler. Like seeing those buzzer beaters and then you run outside to your slanted driveway and you like can't wait to try to recreate it while there's a break in the action. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like, that's what the tournament like sums up basketball for me. I don't have as strong of a feeling on the final fours or the championship games. Like there's not as many that I remember, though. I do recall talking to like Tristan Jebbia about his commitment when uh, the Villanova kid hit that game winning three against North Carolina. And I had to like pause our interview to explain to Tristan Jebbia what just happened. So yeah. that way he was aware of this, uh, what seemed to me a pretty big moment. But yeah, I mean, I it's those first couple round games. Do you know who Drew Nicholas is? Does that name mean anything to you? Uh, wait, wait, is that, are you talking Maryland? Yeah, the Maryland game winner the year after they won the title. Oh, I, yeah. In the, in I the, really like Maryland as a In kid. the corner. Yeah. yeah. He hit it. UNC go, Wilmington. Didn't he hit it falling into his own bench? Like, yep. uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was like the coolest way to hit a shot. Yeah, that's like, that's... Sort of like when Jamar John. this is old school Husker hoops, Jamar Johnson hit a shot with one second. It was an inbounds play from under the basket to beat Kansas at the Devaney Center. 
and it was right in front of the bench and they just like engulfed him, you know, yeah. after he made it. Those are the sweetest shots. Yeah. I mean, that's like when I get like the warm and fuzzies about March Madness, it's those opening day upsets. And do you remember uh, it was recently Georgia State with R.J. Hunter yep. hitting that three pointer? His dad, who has that that injury from the conference tournament, he like falls off his chair in celebration. Uh, yeah, I, I just love that stuff. Like the first couple days of the tournament to me are just still some of the best sports watching that you get every single year. Yeah, then you get your occasional story like a Florida Gulf Coast that one year where they yep. just for a weekend like no one could stop them. I mean, they rip through Georgetown mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, they look like a kind of an and one team that was like had a, a <laughs> like a, a structured and one team. And it was yeah. a that was fun. Um, yeah, you're right. It's it's the first weekend that really makes the tournament. And um, I also love when a big dog is being pushed when they're down like 10 or so with like 15 minutes left in, the, in an early round game. And there's sort of that buzz in the gym, like, Oh boy. Right. And you can, and the fans of course that are neutral get behind the underdog. And of course I love underdog stories, but I just as much enjoy when a big boy like pushes back and like says, no, we're the, we're the, we're the Kings here. I like, I, I like that too. So yeah, I I enjoy the final, you know, because basketball, it could be, you could take 12 minutes to play the last 30 seconds. But that kind of that final swing in one of those games where you've seen a team kind of make a mad comeback. And I think uh, St. Peter's, Kentucky was kind of like this, if I recall correctly. Uh, last year, like you just, I'm always going to pull for the lower seed. Like it, you get a race to two teams. I just feel like I always root for carnage. Like that's, what i want every single time but i i don't know why that's just how i am if, we, if one last thing if we want to localize this before we get to spring football which we will i promise was it terrell taylor was that the name terrell of the taylor yeah from creighton Great. who hit the shot against billy donovan's florida team i was living in the dorms at unl at the time and uh i was in shram shram six or ten i can't remember which one i was there two different years and um Maybe it was just my floor, but this was – I always think about this. Taylor hits the shot. Creighton beats Florida. And at that time, the people on our floor didn't mind it. Like, everybody yeah. was sort of, like, happy for Creighton. It was like, oh, yeah, they did nice upset, you know? And I was – I've always think back to that. I was like, when did that flip? It was, like, in the next couple of years where that really turned, where, like, People can, I don't think you'd see that on a UNL dorm floor now, like a reaction to, to Creighton getting a win like that. It doesn't seem like. Um, it's just, it's interesting uh, how that sort of shifted over the next like three to four years after that. The, the this good like, shift. The yeah, like 15 to 20 years ago, there was this change where suddenly everybody in Lincoln's like, nope, not rooting for them. <laughs> not everyone, I should say, but uh, there's a lot of, I, I don't yeah. think that's going out on a limb to say that. No, I don't think you're wrong. And I, I, I understand what you mean. I mean, I listened to that call uh, in my like eighth grade science class. The the teacher, her dad was like a Creighton season ticket holder. Mm -hmm. And so she's just like, we're not, you know, you can do whatever you want. No one can talk. We're just listening to this game for 45 minutes. And so we, we heard the <laughs> final call because uh, it was like the last class of the day. Because it was right in that like, the three o'clock window. I remember being in high school coming up with creative ways to figure out how to get out of school in time to watch as many of these games as I could. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, it was always a challenge because those best games always seem to take place in that like one thirty to four o'clock window. And then you get home and then the night games yeah. never seem to be as good to me. And I think it's because I could have been anywhere, but it's when you're forced to be in school those are when the games always seem like they're going to be the best. Oh yeah. There was, there was something magical about there. It still is about sporting events that take place during the weekday. Yeah. And if you can um, sneak away to it, especially in those old TV sets, they used to cart around to uh, for elementary school. You'd have to find one of those to locate, to watch like the <laughs> five twelve um, game early on a Thursday. Um, that was uh that was, spe and if you had that teacher that was like, understood and gave you the head nod and it's like go go do it son you know yeah, like yeah. 
that that person still lives warmly in your heart like 20 some years later yeah i some kids today can just watch on their tablet while they're sitting in class so it doesn't have quite the same kids today uh, you know quite the same <laughs> And before Creighton fans get mad at me, I, I used to go to game. I grew up in Omaha. I used to go to the Civic Auditorium, watch Bob Harstad, Chad Gallagher, Dewan Cole, Latrell Reitzel. So don't don't come at me. Um, I, I was probably I probably watched them before uh, before some of the fans today were watching them. Creighton fans, you can come at me. I don't care. Go and see. Yeah, this. you'll take it. I know that. I have no problem with it. <laughs> you like that. You like I that. Yeah. I married one, and now she pretty much only cares about Nebraska basketball. So I'm doing my part. Wow. All right. Let's uh, let's. Be- We're going to get into Nebraska basketball at the end of this podcast. So there's a few things we want to touch on there, but we want to highlight the upcoming spring football season. Brian, when do things actually get underway? Should I know this? Should yeah. I be aware of when practice starts? <laughs> because currently, I am not super aware. Uh, it starts Monday. Okay, well that's good. Yeah, March twentieth. Um, I mean that's the first week of practice. Uh, we'll see exactly what the access is like. Um, I think here pretty soon. Um, so I mean access so far has been pretty good. So it'll be interesting how they choose to do it during the spring. Rules appeared like three times in front of us. He's had all his assistants up. Can't complain about a thing there. Um, I think he wants to be pretty transparent about their operation. So hopefully, uh, hopefully there's some cool stuff in store over the next four to five weeks. Yeah. So as we kind of assess where things sit with Nebraska football, I think it's important to put things a little bit in perspective. They are going to have a lot of fresh new faces in the program. Not all of them are here. Uh, quite a few of them came early, but there's still going to be more that'll show up in the summer. Are there, but there is half of the roster essentially, or a little more than half of the roster returns. Who are some of the guys, Brian, just give me a name or two can be either side of the ball that you are really interested about as it relates to their first sort of foray with Matt rule and this coaching staff getting going here next week. AJ Allen. I mean, back in, November, December, that was like this conversation people kind of whispered about like, oh, are they going to be able to keep A.J. Allen, you know, that for no other reason than you just sort of wonder in the portal era, like, you know, he was recruited by another coach. What's that going to look like? Obviously, he's going to be a popular target of other schools and nothing really came of that. You know, he just he's held steady and here he is. And um, in the four games he played before the collarbone injury, I think people thought, that looks pretty good. That looks like sort of a big 10 back. Now we didn't get the opportunity to actually see that of course, when it mattered um, against, against league competition, but just to see what this staff, how they size him up in what I think is probably one of the strongest parts of the team, the running back position, if you go through it where they actually didn't have to dip in the portal to add anybody because EJ Barthel liked what was in his room. So I'd start with AJ Allen. How about you? Yeah, I think that's a really good one. Um, you know, I was I was building up the AJ Allen hype uh, before the season, and felt like he was going to be the guy who'd have the most carries when you got into November. Obviously, that injury happened, but I I agree with you. I am also uh, quite intrigued by what it could look like with AJ Allen defensively. Here's a, here's another freshman, another guy that you know really I thought I wouldn't say overperformed, but certainly exceeded any expectation I had for him in his freshman year. What about a guy like uh, Malcolm Hartzog? Like, what does it look like for him, for Evan Cooper and that defensive secondary? We know that this staff really likes, you know, like everybody, they want the tall, long defensive backs. Well, that's not Malcolm Hartzog. But in a short amount of time, he showed up on campus. He fulfilled the prophecy of his high school coach who said that he's going to be better than anybody realized. He did it right away, and he was incredibly competitive at that position as a freshman. He had several interceptions, Brian. He had he had some mistakes, but there might be a guy on this roster that that could be a really good defensive back. That I feel like we're all just kind of kind of forget that it happened. Like Malcolm Hartzog was really good for them last year. That was a nice find for Bill Bush in that defense. Yeah, everybody. Everybody tested him, wanted to because of his size and he was young and they did. He did give up a couple uh, deeper balls. But if you remember, he was always like right there. There's a difference between just getting smoked and like, okay, 
he had two he got out three, jumped or yeah whatever. sort of sort of bad luck situations and that now the skeptical sort will say well that's a, the size part coming into play but i th- i don't know about that if you go back and even look at those he he still was right there to contend for those passes in the air so i think that's a very good one he seems like one of those types of players you, that you come along once in a while where it's just like once they crack the door open and they're inside, good luck trying to remove right. them, you know? And so I'll, I'll, I I just have a, I think it's going to be very hard. I know Tommy Hill, I think is moving back to that side of the ball again, um, but it's going to be hard for someone to jump in front of him. And of course you got Quinton on the other side who Ooh, I no think one's he, jumping in front of him. Yeah. They believe is an NFL corner and I think he can be too. So um those two are going to be tough to beat. It feels like, if, honestly, of all the positions on the roster, um, cornerback might be the one where you can make the safest guess yeah. about who who might be the guys up against Minnesota on August 31st. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody else that jumps out to you? Well, we are saying off air, um, you know, Jamari and, and Blaze are now in that part of their career where it's time to been, go. Yeah, they've been okay, and you're like, you've kind of, we've all written the feature stories about how they're on the cusp, maybe, and all that stuff. And now it's like, can you just break break through and, and be a, a real baller? And in defense of those guys, um, I mean, they've had veterans sort of in front of them the whole way, and now that's out of the way. You know, Garrett's gone, and O'Shawn's gone, and Caleb is out. So um I know there's new material here, but those guys I think will have as good a chance as any to make a case uh, with this new staff. And they just, if you see them up close, they're formidable like guys, like as far as their size. And they, I, I think they can play in this league as far as their frames. So from one side of the trenches to the other, how about someone like Turner Corcoran? Like where is he lining up this spring? And they have to use him at left tackle yeah. because they're not going to have – Teddy Prohaska, does he get an opportunity to move inside the guard where he might be a better fit? Is he your right tackle so that way Ben Scott can play center? I think that there's real questions about Turner Corcoran, which it seems weird, Brian, to have to remind people of this. Turner Corcoran was the lineman that Nebraska fans like really wanted and really clamored for. And this was a top 50 recruit at one point in time. And so it hasn't quite worked out how you know people would have wanted. He certainly doesn't feel like the left tackle of the future, though he's had to play there quite a bit. Uh, I want to see what it looks like for Turner Corcoran. And can he stay healthy? Can he put together a good spring? Does he mesh well with Rayola and, and Matt Rule and what they want to do up front? Uh, and then where? Where does he sort of fit in? I mean, those are those are the sort of things I want to know. But offensive line is going to be one of those things I don't think we're going to have a real grasp on coming out of the spring. You still got Teddy Prohaska. Uh, I wonder if they aren't going to try to go find some other offensive linemen in the portal when the May run hits. Uh, I'm just I'm, I'm very curious that what that final picture could look like because it, it changed so much the day they lost Walter Rouse to, to Oklahoma. I mean, it just – everything sort of flipped a little bit. It now feels a little more uncertain. Yeah. I mean, that was a big loss over the course of two days. Um you know, Ben Scott feels like he should be the center, but uh, Ryle has sort of left the door open there. And he does have tackle in his background at Arizona State, which he started a full season there. So you can't completely dismiss that conversation if they felt they had somebody that could really own the command center part. Like, but who is that? You know, like, is there somebody that can step in there and be as good as an experienced guy like Scott at that position at center? I'm not sure about that yet. Um, yeah. So I I don't know where Corcoran ends up. I hope he ends up in a spot though where he can stick, as right. opposed to jumping uh, around. Yeah, it's been tough for him because he's sort of started seasons at like okay, you're going to be the guard, and then someone gets hurt, and he has to go or he has to flip sides because of an injury, and it's just been kind of constant with that. And I think if people remember, you know, he had one game in 2020 at the very end against Rutgers in that weird game on a Friday night and before Christmas. Um, And he played okay. And it kind of, I think got people maybe a little far down the tracks in where over their skis. is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the, and it, it was sort of forgotten. He's a pretty young player. Hadn't really played any college football yet. 
And then he had an injury kind of leading into the next season that really I derailed his fall camp. And so he just needs a good runway. Like if he yeah. could get that into a season, I, th- I still think we can see a different player than we've seen so far. And I also, he's, he's another guy who's at the point in his career where he's an actual like college football player. Now he's been in the system for a few years. Sometimes it takes like three years for a lineman to really find it. And um, he should be now at that point where we start to see the best of him. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's spot on with, with Turner Corcoran. All right. We'll run through every position here. We're just going to alternate them back and forth. We'll start a quarterback and work away to the special teams and just give me, Give me the player you're interested in this spring or a thought you have on the overall position. And you're going to go ahead and start right there. Quarterback? Yeah, just a, I'm just lobbing it in. This is Dunk City. We're Florida Gulf Coast. Let's go. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it's it, here it is. Layup. It's it's Jeff Sims. I mean. So you're going with the alley-oop layup? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what else are you going to say? Like, yes, it's it's sort of interesting, like, who's going to be, like, the third guy, I guess. But because we've seen that it does work its way sometimes of the third guy and also like who sort of amongst the backups, like kind of um, kickstarts things like, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe Harburg gets something going or, you know, there's somebody like that. That's sort of a fun spring story. That could be very true with Casey Thompson out. There is going to be like a secondary quarterback story of somebody who kind of like, don't forget about this guy that you're going to read. Logan about. Smothers. Yeah. And like three weeks. He might be dinged up too, though, if I'm if I'm thinking right. So I wonder if this could be the spring of Harburg. That's a little prediction, like the spring of, of Harburg. Yeah, just what 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 to do with an athlete like him, and could it be QB still? Uh, but yeah, it's Sims and like how he meshes with those other guys. It seems like he's really adapted well to being here, and um, yeah, just like what you know, he's gonna have that moment in front of the fans where. Does he go 12 for 14 in the spring game and just look spot on and looks like a mobile guy who's going to be a problem for defenses, even though it's a practice? We know people will uh, lose their wits about it if he does well. Um, so, yeah, he's this, he's probably story number 1B or whatever of the spring, you know, of the whole thing, if you think about it. Yeah. All right. So I'm at running backs. Yeah. How about Ramir Johnson? What what is uh what's the plan with Ramir Johnson? EJ Barthel mentioned him right away in his press conference. That's a guy that I thought going into 2022 was going to have a really interesting role that you were going to try to get him touches, you know, 10 to 12 times a game, whether it was lined up at running backs, swing him out as a slot receiver, use him as a receiver out of the backfield. Lots of different ways to use Ramir Johnson. The most notable thing about Ramir Johnson's season is the catch that he probably should have had against Illinois that then resulted in the the bad injury for Casey Thompson, like two plays eight or, and then Nebraska ultimately losing that game and subjecting us to just some terrible offense for the next few weeks. But yeah, I mean, that was the sort of season for Ramir Johnson. He's back. What does it look like? And I, I'm really curious. That's a, that's a deep room. They don't have to think about running back a lot. Uh, but I think that Ramir Johnson is going to be an intriguing piece in the whole puzzle. Wide receiver. That's a good name. um, Wide receiver. I mean, Billy Kemp is going to be, I think, the top guy. But but, uh, Marcus Washington. I mean, he was always there for like two or three catches last year. Like he every game, like he would he would pop up. He would make a couple grabs. Um, and he caught his first touchdown actually against Iowa for Nebraska's last points of the season. But, you know, it's got to be sort of a weird place for him because he got a little momentum going with that staff and how it was set up. And now you got to kind of start over again um, with a bunch of new old guys in the room along with you with Fleeks and Camp. And um, that's really interesting to me. But, I mean, he's a – Think about the end of the Georgia Southern game, Schaefer. I know Nebraska lost it, but remember, Marcus Washington was the guy on that drive where Nebraska went like 97, 98 yards, who was making some big time play, yep. made the catch that should have been a touchdown, I think. They called him down at the like one foot line after the review. Um, but he's got that in his bag. We've seen it. Now it's just a matter of can you be more consistent with it? And if he can, 
um, he can be easily one of the top two receivers. Obviously, you could go with Betts or Garcia Castaneda. You could we could play this game and we will all off season. But I'm let's let's not shoot past Marcus Washington when we're thinking about everybody else. Yeah, I'm sort of on the mindset. I don't know how you feel with both Betts and Garcia Castaneda. I have a, a kind of a mindset, and it might just be a defense mechanism. I don't know where it's just a yeah, that's nice. Let's see where it is in August. Let's see where it is in September. Like, I, I mean, it's great that they're back. It's going to be a story. We're going to hear good things about it. We know exactly how this is going to go. And let's just see what it looks like when it's time to play games, where they end up on the depth chart. Like, that's that's ultimately what it is for me with those two guys. So I'm wishing you uh, mm-hmm. Marcus Washington. Tight end, I'm going to go a little bit different here. Uh, obviously, you have Thomas Fedoni, the, uh, the winner of the competition. Is that right? Team captain. A team captain. Um, yeah. Of the of the, of the off season competition, I'm going to go with a guy that I know you like a lot. A guy that uh, maybe gets overlooked, and certainly when you add an Eric Gilbert, and everyone's excited about what Thomas Fedoni could be, or AJ Rollins' names comes up. What about your guy uh, Nate Morkercher? What about uh, what about him? What about like, him? Could he could he find his way into this whole thing? Because we saw at Baylor and we saw at Temple, tight ends weren't a big part of the offense. Like they really weren't. Mm-hmm. They used him to help block. They used him to help control the line of scrimmage. Is that something that Nate Borkircher can give you? Can he work his way up this depth chart? Can he put pressure on a pair of guys that were number one tight ends in their respective recruiting classes? You know who has more catches in the last two years than uh, those guys? Nate Borkircher. So I I, mean, I think he is an interesting player. Um, I don't know. It's a big, big depth chart in front of him. Uh, but I think it's a good opportunity for him to, to kind of show to – to you know a new coach and Bob Wager that he's got something he can provide to this roster yeah and Sean Becton um really loved Nate Borkercher and uh I think Sean Becton's a pretty good coach and a pretty detailed yeah. coach so um I think that says something and and I know Nate had a drop or two at times during the season but young player I mean yeah. he's he, he he's, he's he's another right guy freshman, right yeah, he, yeah, he's another guy where you sort of thought, okay, he he got in the water last year, and now um, he's, he's he's maybe ready for a little bit more. Um, so yeah, obviously Fedone and Gilbert are gonna uh, take a lot of the bandwidth up, but um, I think it's good to let's not forget um, others because you know that Bob Wag- Wager is gonna want to uh, to make those guys, even though they're gonna get all the headlines, feel the heat. And uh, he's got yep. some guys that are capable of doing it. No doubt about it. Offensive line. And you can't say Ben Scott. Yeah. That would be cheating. Um, well. You can say Ben Scott. No, I'm not going to say Ben Scott. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Nuri. Um, okay. That's a good I one. mean, I think he was one of their top two offensive linemen in 2021 behind uh jurgens <clears throat> the grade showed it too and i felt like when he when it was announced that he was going to be suspended for that season it wasn't like one of those things where you're immediately like oh here we go but it, it at least i remember thinking that day when i heard the news was coming like that's going to be this could be where the ball starts rolling down the hill the wrong way like I, I i just thought like he was a really important piece i remember at that time we were going to do our most indispensable huskers yeah and you were actually the one who shared with me that that news was coming and um i was going to have new Italy like sixth or seventh on my mm-hmm. list of most indispensable huskers and uh so that's how much value i placed in him now can he get back and just you know continue in stride with where he was in 21 that's the big question but if he can and ben scott is worth his salt you got it's just a percentage game you got two of the five spots then that you feel pretty good about um that weren't here a year ago and uh you know that that probably lets ryla sleep a little bit better at night so he he's a big deal if he can be that guy who's just like here's your left guard he's solid you know he's gonna get things done for you um and so, yeah, I'd go to him. I uh, every now and then I have these players where I just don't give up my my initially held belief that they're going to be a guy that's going to help out Nebraska, and maybe it doesn't happen right away, and it takes a little bit of time. 
I am willing to uh, I'm willing to go back to the well a little bit here. Henry Lutovsky, don't write him off. There's mm-hmm. a lot of options. There's a lot of options that have more playing experience, but I do not. I, I want Henry Lutovsky in my foxhole. That's a guy that's going to work his ass off. Like that is someone that I think is going to endear himself to the staff. He's going to endear himself if he hasn't already to Donovan Rayola. I don't know exactly how the picture looks. If you got Henry Topsy uh, playing guard for you, because I think that's what he is. I don't think he's going to play tackle. But that is just someone that you know I have heard from so many people that he's got special potential. And I just – maybe this is a spring. It all comes together. You know, there's – every now and then, there just is one of those times where a guy sort of emerges out of a pile of players – and becomes a really good player. I think that could be Henry Lutovsky on the yeah. offensive line. And I expect guys like him to scuffle their first year as a college player. Yeah. Like I, in the trenches, it just sort of goes with the territory. The other guy that people are going to sometimes, I know that they write him off and they shouldn't because he's going to matter is Ethan Piper. Like, yep. I mean, he, he popped back into the lineup last year after getting benched. He could play, he could be a center option. He can play guard. He's an interior type guy. We could put all those spots together for you. So he's going to matter uh, no matter what anyone thinks. Yep. it's uh, I agree with that one too. And if he can handle center, that allows you to play Ben Scott at right tackle, which changes your offensive line uh, a little bit as well. Brian, we're going to take a quick break before we get to the defensive side of the ball. And uh, we'll also talk a little Nebraska basketball when we return. All right, we are running through the positions here for the spring football season. We just ran through the offense. We're going to start on the defensive side of the ball. I don't know. Do we? Do you want to? Do you want to break out interior, exterior, defensive line? Can we even do that? We can I don't try. Even know that we can. I, all right, we we can try. I'll give you the hard one. Give me an interior defensive lineman. Elijah Judy is the most interesting to me because um, I wrote about this the other day, but. There's not a lot of returning snap. Ty Robinson is going to be out this spring. Um, I think they're going to miss Colton Feast, um, who was just a solid guy. Gave you reps. Um, yep. He gave he gave you a lot of snaps. So basically, you have Ty Robinson, you have Stefan Wynn, and you have Nash Hutmacher as the experienced guys. Raquan Buckley is that guy like we'd like to hear from you, you know. Yeah. Um, he's in that mode. But Elijah Judy did not play a lot at Texas A&M, only played like 20-some snaps. So he doesn't have a lot of game reps himself. But the thing in sort of researching his background, he was thought of as more of an edge guy when he arrived to College Station as a recruit. Like he was, I think, 212 as a senior in high school. Then he was Mm -hmm. like 240. And now he's playing at like that 290 to 300 range. So I think he's had to sort of change like, you know, the way he plays football and like his role and all that stuff and adapt to it because of his, his growth. So he's had some time to do that. And he's a Philly guy. The staff is well connected to him. I, you, I know you got him the day he committed and uh, he really stressed that, that uh, yeah. relationship and how he, they sort of bonded over like their backgrounds. And so maybe they can get the most out of him. Yeah. I think he's someone that is uh Excited to kind of be here. I think he's one of those COVID casualties where he was a 2020 recruit. He never got to take or 2021 recruit, never got to really take uh, visits or or do anything to that degree. And then he had to pick a school. He chooses Texas A&M. There's a bit of a culture shock for him uh, going from Philadelphia down to College Station. And so when he got to restart his recruitment, he really locked into the relationships of the people that are going to be there. Nebraska, if a new staff really stood out to him because he, he feels like those guys are going to be there. And he's an interesting piece. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, if he has a good spring, that'd be a, a good sign for Nebraska. I think if if we're going to the, the outside guys, and we mentioned both of them earlier, you almost have to say their names in tandem with Blaze Gunnarsson and Jamari Butler, right? Like those guys are going to be on some form of an edge. We don't know if it's going to be hand in the dirt we don't know if it's going to be off the edge, off the off a defensive lineman. But if you're talking about the the edge positions, those are two guys that are going to have a lot more staff opportunities with no O'Shawn Mathis and no Garrett Nelson. So it's time to go uh, for, for Blaze Gunnarsson and Jabari Butler and, uh, you know, a number of other people that kind of qualify in, in that category. I, I have a tough time until we kind of see practice a few times. 
it's tough for me to figure out who looks like a, a defensive end, who's going to be playing, you know, um, off the off the line, like what that actually looks like. We we talk three three five all day, but we don't really know what it's going to look like yet, and we don't know mm-hmm. how often they're going to be in that three three five versus a four two five versus a four three versus whatever. Yeah, I sense it's going to be hard to put labels on some guys. Labels um, will be tough, but we love labels, and we'll work it. Yeah. MJ Sherman, I mean, he could fit in as an edge guy, and you hope he just takes off. But Chief Borders, listed as a linebacker, yep. certainly could could has. I mean, he stood up front at the recent press conference, and you're like, yeah, that guy could probably line up on the edge too. Um, and so, yeah, a, one or two of or both of those guys could really bulk up how that picture looks and how we talk about sort of the defensive line as a whole if they're. Uh, if they can take off as now in their new location. Are you, are you concerned about the picture of the defensive line as you kind of extrapolate it from this spring to looking ahead to next fall? I just, just going into spring when I look at the, when you just scan the roster and I know they can do creative things. I do worry about the interior part of it. I'm not worried about necessarily the edge guys or the backers, but it's those, like we just mentioned, there's like three guys with some experience, Elijah, Judy, you hope for, but I feel like you need like six to eight guys almost that you pretty are sturdy to go through this league in October and November. Um, Now, you know, Tony White, I'm sure has thought about all this in great detail as he thinks about, what he thinks he has. And now he's going to learn more about what he actually has. Um, and there's ways to adapt and, and work around it. But um, I do wish they had like one or two more guys like that are like 280 to 300 pound dudes, like a, like a feast type guy, just like, you know, is going to give you solid. He could give you 55 reps on a given Saturday. And you know that you can get quality work out of that. Um so I don't know if they need to get one more guy there um, before this is all said and done or not, but that is a little bit of a concern for me. Yes. Yep. All right. Second level. Um, you know, you know, the names, Luke Reimer, Nick Henrich. We don't know a whole lot. What's behind him. It's going to be a big spring for a guy like Randolph Kapai. Yep. Who yeah. else? Well, um, M- Mackay Bayer, um, would fall in that same category. It's like go time, you know, let's see if, if someone there can, can make a dent in things. Um, I know I, I just said him, but chief borders is listed as a backer and, um, he's obviously well thought of over there already. Mm -hmm. Uh, very, you know, he's got a great personality, but I think they think he's got some game too. And, um, you know, he came from the sec and that doesn't mean that you're just going to come in here and dominate or anything, but, uh, he was a, a pretty highly sought after guy as a recruit. And I feel like um, if he's if he's sturdy and they can use him as a piece that they bounce around a lot, um, that can make you feel a lot better about that second level, however, wherever they put him. Uh, so Chief Borders, I think, is going to be huge. Uh, I think he's going to be a huge offseason story. And then it's just a matter of. Um, what does that mean when he's playing against like Michigan? How does that look like? How does that translate? But he's definitely feels like a guy who's going to be important. Yeah. Uh, we talked about cornerback a little bit earlier. You have anything you want to add there? Um, no, but I'll, I'll I didn't know if you're going to go there. I'll, I'll just shift it to nickel quick. Um, Cause you could put them kind of together. Isaac Gifford again came up just in a mention from Tony white when he was on the radio the other day as a good leader and stuff like that, he's a veteran now. And and the thing about Isaac is, you know, he's a little, um, he's not quite the same size as Luke Gifford was, <laughs> but he's actually played more snaps and started more games than Luke did at this point in his career. And so I just really like the trajectory he's on have, knowing what Luke did and not saying it, they are going to just parallel each other. But I think Isaac is now to that point where last year he kind of got through that season where it's like, hey, can you replace JoJo? Can you be that guy? And um, he did an adequate job, and now I think he can do a way better job after having gone through that. And, of course, Javen Wright's going to push him too. 
Um, Javen Wright, I think is, is someone who, you know, he, he's got freak size and a lot of athletic traits that, that should lead to success there. And I, this staff's what I'm guessing going to take a long look at him. Yeah, absolutely. Safety, an area where Nebraska struggled at times last year. They like Buford a lot. I don't think he's going through spring though, right? Like he's, no. he's got an injury. Uh, what does that safety spot look like? I don't, I don't know what to do with that one yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, you obviously got miles is still here. I mean, yeah, Miles Farmer. so uh, I, I don't think anyone's going to just kick him out the door. Uh, Deshaun Singleton um, is a guy who I know this last staff really liked. And um, I actually thought going into the season was going to play a lot more than he I did. did. Too. I did too. Um, you know, what's kind of interesting about the safeties Omar Brown is still there, right? Yep, he is. Yeah. Um, he could be a sa- safety nickel, but you've got this group of guys. Matt Rule said it in a line. He's like, we got a ton of defensive backs. And I, I counted them the other day. There are 25 defensive backs listed on the roster and six wow. nickels. So 31 total. So you've got these guys like Kane Williams, Jaleel Martin, Kobe Bretts. You know, you could keep naming them. Noah Pola Gates is still here. Gage Stinger. Uh, yeah. Gage as a, as a nickel guy. Yep. Um, so some of those guys, you wonder like, where's their spot? They got to first prove they're in the line. Um, but then could a few of them, a couple of them move somewhere. The staff has shown they're um, interested in like, Oh, this guy could actually move up a level, you know, and we could use them this way. So th- there's all sorts of guys like that who, um, you don't know if anything's going to come of it, but you kind of would guess this spring that one or two of those names might be like a story, like um, in early April, we're writing about on a Tuesday, you know, like, Oh, you know, um, Jaleel Martin or somebody's making a push or whatever. Like, right. so you, that's, that's sort of what spring's all about. So the, those guys are pretty interesting to me. No doubt about it. All right. Uh, specialist. How do we feel there? Is there, is there anything you really want to mention in terms of the specialists? I just think they're uh Jimmy Bleak Row didn't go anywhere. Yeah. Uh Ryan Bushini's back. He's well liked by the staff. Oh, they love Bushini. Uh tough kid. I mean, we we saw last year Bushini was kicking on like one wheel for you know a few games and and still doing a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, I think we're gonna see even more out of him if they can keep protect him and not get him beat up. I would like to see what his yardage total looks like this year. Um, cause I, I think he's got a lot of talent. Um, beyond that, the kicker spot of course is going to get pretty interesting when Alvano. Right. Cause he's not um, here this spring. No, nope. no. Nope. Nope. Um, so, I mean, it's a big spring though for bleak road. Like if you can go out there and you're just nailing everything, right. Um, that puts it in the coach's mind. Um, I don't know. I've been asked to like predict like before who, who's going to be the kicker. And I I've said Alvano just cause I, I don't know. I sort of ride that wave of momentum he had from high school. And I'm like, I just believe in that guy. The way you he saw his last game, it was yeah, in the stadium where he's kicking in. It's just like, he's never going to miss in that stadium ever again. That's what I think. So, um, that's my pick, I guess. But I, I, I hope Timmy just puts up a good fight. Like I'm, I like, you know, that it's like, we were talking earlier about when, a. Uh, underdog pushes the the three seed, you know, on, on Thursday or Friday in the first round of the tournament. You love when the three seed pushes back. And I don't know if Timmy Bleak Road's the three seed, but he's the guy who's the returning starter. And you'd love to see him just respond to that challenge and really make it a tough call where the, I don't know. It, that, it's pretty easy though. You just look at the numbers on your paper and like who made the most kicks. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the challenge would be, if Alvano has a consistently better leg from deeper, I always feel like that's a really valuable thing. Like if you can, you know, if you can guarantee at least the opportunity to put up a field goal every time you cross the 35 versus you have to get into the 30. Does that make sense? Like if you, you know, I think 53 is the new 43 in football, like yeah. you know, for kickers, like you want a guy where you feel like when you're at the 35 yard line, that you're going to get points out. You got a very good chance of getting points. And it's understood occasionally you're going to miss those because they're long, but um, I mean, it's incredible now and we've seen it. There's something in the water around here with 
guys like Zerline and Maher, who have some of the strongest legs the NFL has ever seen, hitting 60 plus yarders right. like it's nothing. To say but, nothing of Alex Henry, who kind of kicked that whole thing off. Yes. So, you know, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. And you wonder if all things are equal, if that ends up being a tiebreaker, if somebody can show, like, hey, right. I, I have the 54 yard club in my bag and this guy doesn't, you know? Yeah. All right, let's let's uh, let's do a little basketball, shall we? We have not discussed basketball since Nebraska's season. And did you guys talk on Thursday? You probably talked on Thursday about Nebraska basketball season ending, right? We talked a little bit about it, yeah. yeah. Um, did I, you so think we... – I feel like you felt like they were going to get into the NIT even at 500, right? So that was a little bit of a surprise? I wasn't sure. I thought they might have to win one game in Chicago and possibly – I think we – we kind of came to the cl- conclusion they might need one, maybe two. And the after it played out, I actually think they might have needed two. The way oh, wow. I mean, don't I don't know, but it seemed like um it seemed like it was a pretty crowded field even to get in the NIT. A lot of teams in the middle. Just a yeah. big year of teams around like 17, 18 wins. Cause think about it, like three big ten teams fell to the NIT. Mm-hmm. And I know Husker fans probably saw Wisconsin in there and are like, what the stink, you know, like Nebraska beat them head to head. They had the same record in conference. The difference was, and it is true, Wisconsin had piled up a few more quad one and quad two wins. I think it was like 11 to seven yeah. in favor of Wisconsin. And um, so I think that was probably the advantage for them. Um, but then you had Michigan that was at Rutgers. Of course, some people thought got snubbed from the NCAA and they're in the NIT. So as, as you saw it play out when the brackets actually came out, I was thinking like, man, it would might've even been tough for Nebraska to get in there if they had just beat Minnesota, but lost to Maryland the next night. Yeah, I, I definitely felt like they had to beat Minnesota and it definitely to me on that Wednesday, uh, when they lost that game, it seemed like their season was probably over at that point, unless they wanted to be in the CBI. So Everything moves forward now. Obviously, there's a big Tomanaga discussion to be had, but we don't have enough information to really have that conversation right now. What we do have, two guys are already in the portal. Neither probably comes as a surprise to you, Brian. Oled Kojanets, the uh, Lithuanian big man, uh, entered the portal first. And then Denim Dawson, who started a game this year, as you might recall. Uh, and played a little bit early and then saw his playing time sort of disappear late is in the portal. Mm. Any immediate thoughts on those two guys? Well, I mean, Oleg, you love when you have a seven footer on your roster, but it was, he was a developmental guy. It was taking time and it felt like it was going to take, I don't know, from, from my seat in the bleachers, it seemed like it was going to take a little while uh, for that to, to work out how you wanted it to. Um, so that one didn't surprise me at all. Denim was, I don't know if I'd say a minor surprise. I, it, he, he, you know, he, his minutes really did dwindle at the end of the year. He started eight games in the middle of big 10 play. And then the last five games, he played a total of 14 minutes. So he, in the last four games, he didn't play more than three minutes in any of those games. So he, he clearly, sort of in the run that they had where things were really working for him. Um, he wasn't as much involved in that, you know, and he wasn't um, a dynamic offensive player. You were kind of hoping that part of his game and it might happen for him somewhere would come along. He was definitely a defensive weapon. He had some really bright moments. Like uh, he did a heck of a job on sense ball from Ohio state in the game. They won. He had a nice game against Penn State. There were these moments where you saw he's really a live wire out there and you kind of liked his energy. Um, but, you know, I I think it's something that you don't like to lose guys who are young and developing in your program, but this is just the way of college sports now. Like, and um, you're going to have to every year probably have four to five openings on your roster where you have to... Um, Cycle. You have to figure it out in a hurry every year. And it's probably stressful. Like, I mean, everybody's doing the same thing across the country right now. Like, I I mean, on I was looking on Twitter today. Indiana's got a game coming up in the tournament. 
And the, the story, the big story in a place like Indiana where basketball's everything is like a, a kid they're trying to get from a lower level program, you know, who averaged 17 points. That's like the story right now. So um, that's what you're up against. Everybody's got their elbows out in this game, and it's not easy to uh, get exactly who you want. But Nebraska's got to find the right pieces to at least give you what Walker and Greasel did. Um, on the court, which is not easy, but also sort of keep going in this template of like what your culture is. Like they really liked what they had as far as how the team connected and all that. And you got to start all over with that again. In a yeah. way. I was going to ask you if there's one thing that you can kind of take out of the season. Do you feel like there's a template is the wrong word. Blueprint might even be the wrong word, but it's, do you, do you think there's a framework for what Nebraska basketball needs to be under Fred Hoiberg to be successful that we saw this year? Yeah, I mean, the the easiest way to say it, it's sort of cliche, but it was true, and the fans appreciated it. It was like a grittier team. It yeah. Just like the, whatever formula of the roster that they, they're like, this can work as far as like how these guys play off each other. I mean, there's there were more talented teams that they Nebraska beat some teams that were more talented than them. But Nebraska had I felt like um, they did have a lot of like pluck to them and sort of like you, you felt like when there were 50 50 balls that they, they would go after them with with uh, more aggression. And it meant a lot to them to get that than past teams. So I think you're looking for those type of guys who you just feel like um, they understand it's the. Uh, it's the junkyard stuff that you've got to go get to win in this league. And you got to find those players who, yes, they can score it, but they're also willing to sacrifice, you know, their body and all that stuff that you got to do to, to, you know, get those two or three possessions your way that tilt games that are three, four point games, you know, in the big 10. No doubt about it. Anything you want to add on basketball before we close this thing out? No, I mean, it's uh it'll be an interesting ride. I know it's probably a nervous time for Husker fans because they did like this team and you, you knew, you knew it was going to be tough to replace, um, you know, Walker and Sam. Uh, but you know, that's, that's been known for months that this was coming as far as the two guys who just entered the portal. I wish them all the best. I don't think it, it derails Nebraska's hopes. It's just more spaces that you gotta, you gotta find the right answers to now. So, um, and you, and they can do that. Maybe, you know, maybe you upgrade there, um, that there's a, there's a real possibility of that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Brian, uh, good podcast here. We went 53 minutes. That's pretty good for us. Um, we hit on a lot. Spring football starts next week, huh? So I should probably next not week. plan anything. I need to keep that open. It says on your, under your name, you're about to go on a boys trip. Um, it says, oh, under your yeah. Name for, mm-hmm. So I was uh, I forgot to take that super off of my last appearance. <laughs> That's not going to make no, any sense. No, I I like it. I like it. I mean, uh, but it was a yeah. it was a joke about the Rayola thing because like his response about why he went out to Nebraska was he went on a boys trip. Oh, okay, I see. It was yeah. my last appearance before I went out to to Vegas where they took all my money and my okay. dignity and my pride. You didn't, you didn't you didn't do too hot, huh? No, uh, played a lot of roulette. Didn't win a lot of money. Um, gambled uh sports gambling did did okay there went to a lot of conference tournament basketball games saw saw our old friend tim miles he's as active as ever uh getting after officials san jose state had a fun team that was uh i i feel bad i should have told everyone to just load up on arizona state because yeah. san jose state beat the nevada team that played last night that nevada team was not a tournament team they weren't better than san jose state they were an okay team. I have no idea why they were in the first four. They they got the the just result in a thirty point loss or whatever it was to Arizona State on uh, on Wednesday night. So yeah. you have a tournament. You wanna you wanna reveal your bracket? I gotta make picks. I gotta get in the the Husker twenty four seven bracket here. Oh yeah, I better let you go here in a, within three minutes because we you only got about forty five minutes uh, before you're out. I know. Um, I I don't have. Um, a lot of upsets picked. I I uh I picked Purdue to win it. Chalky Christopherson, they call him. Yeah, yeah, it's boring. You picked Purdue to win it. 
Yeah. That's uh, not chalky. I don't think people people don't trust Purdue. I don't either. <laughs> but <laughs> it was one of those deals. I don't know if you sometimes I do this with brackets. I kind of like that Purdue team. Like I, I've never had a beef with Matt Painter or really sure. thought anything ill of him. And I like Edie. I think he's just like, you know, for a giant Throwback. man. Yeah, he's like you he's a pleasant sort and he's uh, easy to root for. And um I kind of thought that's a team I could get behind, like supporting them as they go through it. But I do think you sometimes you pick a team. I picked Virginia the year they won it, and I knew that like every game you were gonna have to white knuckle. Right it out. Yeah, whereas like it, it could be a four point game against a sixteen seed with three minutes left. You just had to accept that, but that they might find a way. And I feel like Purdue is very much in that same category. Um Houston, I think, is sir, it would be a fun story. And I know our, our CBS colleague, Jim Nance, um, who's very close to us. Um, yeah. Yeah. He's a. Uh, fruit he, baskets are always nice. He's a Houston grad and um, is is even saying like we and stuff and kind of like wants him to be in his last final four on the mic. So I, I, would, I wouldn't mind seeing that um, if Houston sort of got in. Okay. All right. Do you have a. Uh... How often do you feel like you pick the winner? Do you have like a favorite, like you knew it before other people kind of thing? My favorite pick ever was, uh, they were a one seed, I believe, but I picked UConn in one of, Cal- it might've been Calhoun's first national title team. It was the one with Khalid El Amin. Mm-hmm. And like um, Ray Allen, was he on that team? I don't know if Ray Allen was on it. It had Ricky Moore. Jake Voskel was a guy who was I on that, that team. I remember that name, yeah. Um, they were just, they were gritty and, um, they beat a very good Duke team in the, I believe the title game. And, um, Duke was the team everybody thought was going to win it that year. So, uh, I was really proud of that UConn pick. And then one year I rode Minnesota, the final four with Clem Haskins when I was in high school and they had Bobby Jackson was on their team. Yeah. Yeah. And my favorite tournament team of all time, they didn't win it but I loved them was UMass. I love the Camby team. Yes. I love that team. I love Carmelo Travieso, Edgar Padilla, I believe was the point guard. Um, yeah, they had a dude. I wish I could think of their starting five. Now there's two guys I'm missing. They, they had some guys that I loved though. Yeah. But they got beat by Kentucky. It's fun when you kind of have that, you develop like the affinities for a team just based on watching them in the tournament or whatever previously. I got really big into Maryland the year before they won the title and was just devastated when they lost in the final four to Duke and then wrote them like the whole next year. We're talking Lonnie Baxter, Steve Blake, Juan Dixon, Chris Wilcox, Drew Nicholas was the sixth man on that team. I mean, I really liked that Maryland team. So I, I took them like a, you know, right away, like all the way through. And then they pretty much just handle business. Like they didn't really Mm -hmm. have a lot of close games. I feel like my proudest moment though, the next year I picked Syracuse to win the title. And that was the Carmelo Anthony year. And I I picked them entirely because of Carmelo Anthony. I was like, this guy's good. He's just going to do it. And they just kept winning. Weren't they like a three or four seed too? Yeah. I, I think I have three successful like brackets ever. And one was Maryland, one was Syracuse, and then the year that Kentucky was far away the best team in the country or whatever um, with Anthony Edwards. The, I had them uh, – or Anthony yeah. Davis, not Anthony Edwards. Anthony Davis, I had them uh, winning the title. Otherwise, I feel like I get too cute. I, mm-hmm. I put too many fours and fives to go far or whatever. Uh, I'll drop a random seven in there sometimes. I'm, I'm no good at the brackets. I'm just bad at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I have uh, I have Texas in my final four over Houston, actually, even though I want Houston to do wow. well. And uh, I don't know. Texas, kind of a weird team because, of course, they had a whole s- scandal within their season. Yep. And, and then you got Alabama with their whole deal, like, you, you know, and they're one of the favorites. So it's a, it's a weird – It's there's some weird storylines connected to this year. But, yeah, it is fun when you find that one team where it's like, these are my boys. Like, you feel like you, you watch – you maybe you watched them get knocked out one year in the second round or the sweet 16, but you're like, there's something there and I'm going to remember these guys next year. And you don't forget it when the brackets come yep. out. 
That's how I feel a little about UCLA. I uh, rode them a little bit gambling wise the year they ran to the final four and then they lost on that Jalen Suggs thing. Mm -hmm. And I've just been a huge Tiger Campbell person ever since then. So I was excited to watch him play out in Vegas. Oh, last one. And then we'll we'll head out. You're talking about games you remember. UCLA, the year after they won the title with the O'Bannon brothers, Mm -hmm. they they still had some of the guys from that team. Is this the Missouri game? No. That was okay. the year. That was the year they won it. Uh, that was a hell of a game. I said, and he hit the shot. But uh, in Boise, I still remember the Boise court, which I wish the courts were still like, uh, yeah. you know, the authentic instead of just court. completely yeah, just general. Um, but UCLA got beat in the first round by Princeton oh. on a back on a back door cut, what? which was like perfect Princeton style with like two seconds left, and it was just so like um, by the book of like underdog upsetting a, a a giant. So that one always sticks out. All right. March Madness memories of Brian Christopherson. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how your bracket's doing when we come back next week. We'll see how mine's doing. I'm going to fill it out in about four minutes. I think I, I'll give you a taste. I think Marquette's going to be my champion. I think Shaka Smart's going to do well. it. And it'd They're be poetic well. justice if it was over Texas. Who wouldn't enjoy that? Oh, that would be nice. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see if either team makes it through the first two rounds uh, when we discuss next week. For Brian Christopherson, I'm Mike Schaefer. Be sure to stop by Husker 24-7. Plenty of content coming up. Missouri, Kansas this week. We didn't get into it much. A lot of recruiting stuff there. Michael Brown's killing it. And then next week, Brian, we're going to be talking start of spring football. And uh, you might have noticed there's going to be a few people in town next mm-hmm. weekend. We'll, we'll probably hit on that a time or six during the podcast next week. Uh, so be sure to stop by Husker 24-7. We're updating that list constantly. And we'll, we'll catch you next week with more podcasts.